Mr. Funny lived in a teapot. It had two bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen and a living room, and it suited Mr. Funny very nicely. One day Mr. Funny was having lunch. He wasn't very hungry, so he only had a daisy sandwich and a glass of toast. Delicious, he murmured to himself as he finished his funny lunch. After lunch, Mr. Funny decided to go for a drive in his car. Mr. Funny's car was a shoe. Have you ever seen a car that looks like a shoe? It looks very funny. As he drove along, everybody who saw him laughed to see such a funny sight. He passed a worm at the side of the road. The worm thought Mr. Funny and his funny car was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. And he nearly he laughed himself in two. <laughs> he passed a pig in a field. The pig thought Mr. Funny and his funny car was the funniest thing she'd ever seen. She nearly laughed her tail off. <laughs> Even the flowers he passed thought that Mr. Funny was the funniest thing that they'd ever seen. They nearly laughed themselves out of the ground. <laughs> Eventually, Mr. Funny came to some crossroads. He didn't know which way to go, so he looked at the signpost. One of the signs said to the zoo. Oh, that'd be fun, thought Mr. Funny to himself. So he, he drove his shoe towards the zoo. When he arrived at the gate of the zoo, he stopped. It was closed. I'm sorry, said the zookeeper. Uh, but we went to close the zoo because all the animals have a cold, and they're all feeling very sorry for themselves. Oh dear, said Mr. Funny. And then he thought. Perhaps I could help to cheer them up, he said. Well, said the zookeeper, worth a try, I suppose. And he opened the gate. Mr. Funny drove into the zoo in his shoes. first thing he saw was an elephant. It was true. The elephant was feeling very sorry for herself. Very sorry indeed. Mr. Funny stood and looked at the sad-looking elephant. And the sad-looking elephant stood and looked at Mr. Funny. Oh dear. Then, do you know what Mr. Funny did? He pulled a funny face. <laughs> Mr. Funny, as you can imagine, is very good at pulling funny faces. The elephant giggled. <laughs> He'd never seen anything so funny. Mr. Funny pulled another funny face. And the elephant, the elephant burst out laughing. <laughs> the elephant laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> oh, he laughed so hard, she nearly laughed her trunk off. Oh, and she felt a lot, lot better. Mr. Funny went over to the lion house. There was a lion, feeling extraordinarily sorry for himself. Mr. Funny stood and looked at the sad-looking lion, and the sad-looking lion stood and looked at Mr. Funny. Oh, dear. And then Mr. Funny pulled the funniest-looking face that's probably ever been pulled anywhere, ever. Now, you've heard a lion roar before, haven't you? Well, this lion roared, too, with laughter. <laughs> he laughed so hard, he did, oh, laughed his whiskers to pieces. <laughs> and then Mr. Funny went round to see all the other animals in the zoo. Oh, dear, what a miserable-looking lot. For all of them, Mr. Funny pulled funnier and funnier faces. The big brown peg that burst out laughing. And the giraffe laughed so hard she nearly laughed her neck into an oh, 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 into a knot. <laughs> and the hippopotamus nearly laughed himself out of his skin. And the penguins nearly laughed their flippers floppy. <laughs> oh, the leopard. Oh, oh, you should have seen him. He, he laughed so hard, he nearly laughed his spots off. His spots off. Oh, oh, what a pantomime. Oh, 
Oh, Mr. Funny, uh, giggled the zookeeper, who'd started laughing as well. Oh, Mr. Funny, I... Oh, thank you very, very much indeed, sir, for coming to cheer us all up. <laughs> oh, nothing, really, replied Mr. Funny, modestly, and drove off in his shoe. Later, when Mr. Funny arrived home, he chuckled to himself. Well, he said, well, that's the end of another funny day. <laughs> and he parked his shoe and went inside his teapot. And because he was feeling thirsty, he made himself a nice hot cup of cake. <laughs> What a lot of Mr. Men there are. I wonder which one we shall be meeting next. Can you guess? Mr. Dizzy was, to be quite honest, not very clever. If you were to ask Mr. Dizzy what was the opposite of black, he'd say, uh, uh, the opposite of black is uh, pink. He lived in a house on a hill which he'd built himself. A not very clever house. One of Mr. Dizzy's problems was that he lived in a country where everybody else was terribly clever. Clever land. Even the birds were clever in clever land. Everything and everybody in Cleverland was clever. You'll never see a worm reading a book anywhere else but Cleverland. Poor Mr. Dizzy. Everything around him was so clever that it made his head spin. One morning Mr. Dizzy was out for a walk and he met a pig. What's uh, big and has big ears and a trunk? Said the clever pig to Mr. Dizzy. Um, um... A mouse, said Mr. Dizzy. The pig, <laughs> pig laughed sarcastically at Mr. Dizzy and went, went off, shaking his head. Then Mr. Dizzy met an elephant, a clever elephant. What's, uh, what's small and furry and uh, likes cheese? The elephant asked cleverly. Um, a pig, replied Mr. Dizzy. <laughs> Clever elephant laughed down his trunk. <laughs> pig, a pig, you silly man. And off he went. Poor Mr. Dizzy. Mr. Dizzy decided he didn't want to talk to anybody else that day. So he went for a walk in the wood where he knew that he wouldn't meet anybody. He felt very miserable about not being clever. And as he walked along, a tear trickled down his cheek. Poor Mr. Dizzy. Then, in the middle of the wood, he came across a well. Little did Mr. Dizzy know that it was a wishing well. The day was warm, and so he decided to take a drink of water from the well. Mr. Dizzy drank deeply, but he was still unhappy. Oh, I do wish I could be clever, he sighed. Little did Mr. Dizzy know that whoever drinks deeply from the water at the wishing well, his wish will come true. And Mr. Dizzy had wished that he could be clever. And his wish had come true. <laughs> 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 
He was clever, but he didn't know it. Not yet. On the way home, Mr. Dizzy came across the elephant and the pig he had met earlier. They were telling each other about how they'd made Mr. Dizzy look silly by asking him a question he couldn't answer. They were giggling and sniggling about it. When they saw Mr. Dizzy approaching from the wood. Oh, yeah, here he comes again, and giggled the clever pig. Oh, let's, let's ask him another, another question, sniggered the clever elephant. Mr. Dizzy came up to them. Tell us, said the clever pig, trying to keep a straight face. What's, um, what's white and woolly and goes bah? Why, a sheep, of course, replied Mr. Dizzy. Pick and the elephant were amazed. T to tell the truth, so too was Mr. Dizzy. He suddenly felt very, very clever. And it was a, a not unpleasant feeling. Uh, tell us, uh, said the clever elephant, what has four legs, a tail, and goes woof? Well, that's easy, replied Mr. Dizzy. A dog, of course. The clever pig and the clever elephant couldn't understand how Mr. Dizzy had become so clever in one morning. Mr. Dizzy couldn't understand how he'd become so clever in one morning. But you know how he'd become so clever in one morning, don't you? Now, let me ask you a question, said Mr. Dizzy to the pig. You? grunted the pig rudely. You? Ask me a question? Never ridiculous. There's no question you could ask me that I couldn't answer. Really? smiled Mr. Dizzy. Well then, can you tell me what's fat and pink and goes a tissue, a tissue? What's fat and pink and goes a tissue, a tissue? repeated the pig looking worried. Mm, there's nothing that, uh, that's fat and pink and goes a tissue, a tissue. Nothing, eh? said Mr. Dizzy. And he tickled the pig's nose. Tissue, tissue, sneezed the pig. The answer is you, said Mr. Dizzy. You are fat and pink, and you're going a tissue, a tissue. The clever pig looked downright, if not down left, miserable. Mr. Dizzy turned to the elephant, who, incidentally, had stopped sniggering. No, said Mr. Dizzy. Let me ask you a question. What's large and goes dobbit, dobbit? What's large and goes dub it, dub it, repeated the elephant, looking worried. There's nothing that's large and goes dub it, dub it. Oh, yes, there is, grinned Mr. Dizzy. There certainly is something that's large and goes dub it, dub it. And he tied a jumbo knot in the clever elephant's trunk. Dub it, dub it, cried the elephant, who wanted to say stop it, stop it, but couldn't talk properly with a knot in his trunk. Mr. Dizzy grinned and went home. <laughs> what a lot of Mr. Men there are. I wonder which one we should be meeting next. Can you guess? This is the sad story of Mr. Bump. The trouble was that Mr. Bump just could not help having little accidents. If there was something for Mr. Bump to bump into, he'd bump into it all right. For instance, if you were to see Mr. Bump walking down the street in your town, and if there happened to be something to bump into down that street, then you know what would happen, don't you? Bump!
Mr. Bump was just the same at home. He lived in an extremely nice home. But even there, he couldn't help having those little accidents. For instance, one morning when Mr. Bump went outside his house, he noticed that the chimney pot had come loose in a storm the night before. I must fix that before it falls off, thought Mr. Bump to himself. And he hurried off to his garden shed to fetch a ladder. very long ladder. Mr. Bump walked up the garden path with the ladder on his shoulder. He turned the corner of the garden path. Crash with the living room window. Oh dear, thought Mr. Bump. And he turned to see what had happened. Crash with the kitchen window behind him. Oh dear, thought Mr. Bump again. And he rested the ladder against the wall of the house so that he could climb up onto the roof to mend the chimney pot. Crash with the bedroom window. So you can see how Mr. Bump had his little accidents. Mr. Bump had had many jobs, but somehow they never seemed to last very long. As soon as anything got lost, or broken, or splintered, or snapped, or cracked, or torn, or burst, or wrenched, or crunched, or split, or slit. Guess who got the blame? For instance, when Mr. Bump worked on a farm. He tripped over the farm dog and spilt the milk. And the farm cat lapped it up. For instance, when Mr. Bump was a postman, he got his hand stuck in the pillar box. They had to fetch the fire brigade to come and set him free. For instance, when Mr. Bump was a carpenter, he found that when he was hammering nails, he hammered his thumb most of the time, and the nail hardly at all. In order to recover from this series of rather unfortunate happenings, Mr. Bump decided to go away for a holiday. There, he could think about what sort of job he could do where he wouldn't be such a nuisance to everybody. So, he set off to the station to catch a train to the seaside. While Mr. Bump was on holiday, several things happened. For instance, he fell off a boat into the sea, and the lifeboat had to come and rescue him. For instance, one day when he was quietly walking along the beach, minding his own business, he got his foot stuck in a bucket. And as he couldn't get it off, he had to hop round with it on his foot for hours. And as he hopped along the beach, he hopped straight into a large hole that somebody had dug. And he had to stay there all night because he couldn't climb out on his own. However, despite all these little accidents, Mr. Bump enjoyed his holiday. And while he was there, he had a splendid idea about what sort of a job he should do. It was quite the best idea Mr. Bump had ever had. An absolutely splendid idea. And now, Mr. Bump works happily for Mr. Barley, the farmer. Mr. Barley has 
rather large apple orchard on his farm. And that's where Mr. Bump works. Mr. Bump's job is picking apples. But he doesn't use a ladder to climb up the tree to pick the apples. Like other apple pickers, oh no. <laughs> no, Mr. Bump has a much better way of picking apples than that. He just walks about. And before long, Mr. Bump, being Mr. Bump, walks into a tree. Down falls an apple. And Mr. Bump catches it. This makes the job of picking apples much easier. Mr. Bump is very pleased about his new job, and Mr. Bar is very pleased about his new apple picker. So, you see, the story of Mr. Bump isn't such a sad story after all, is it? <laughs> ooh, ooh. Mr. Fussy was fussy about everything. Absolutely everything had to be neat and tidy and in its proper place. Mr. Fussy spent all day and every day rearranging his furniture and making sure that the flowers grew in a straight line in his garden and trying to find specks of dust where there couldn't possibly be specks of dust because he spent all his time making sure that there weren't any specks of dust. One fine morning, Mr. Fussy was having breakfast. He was very fussy about what he ate. He opened the marmalade pot. Oh, he exclaimed, it's got bits in it. And he spent the rest of the morning separating the bits from the marmalade. Or, if you prefer, the marmalade from the bits. Fussy old fuss pot, people used to call him. Then Mr. Fussy went out into his garden. And he spent the rest of the day straightening out all the blades of grass on his lawn. Fussy old fuss pot. That evening, Mr. Fussy was in his kitchen ironing his shoelaces, when he heard a crash outside. <gasps> What's to do? he murmured to himself, and hurried outside to investigate. There, with a broken garden gate in one hand, and an old battered suitcase in the other, and a sheepish grin on his face, stood an untidy person, Mr. Clumsy. Whoops, he said, holding up the garden gate. It came off in me hand. Who, spluttered Mr. Fussy, looking in horror at his garden gate, are you? Oh, I'm, I'm Mr. Clumsy, replied the untidy person, grinning. And he stepped forward to shake Mr. Fussy's hand. He tripped over and fell on the lawn. My grass, cried Mr. Fussy. My straight grass. You, you bent it. And he got down on his hands and knees and started straightening the grass. But who are you? he asked over his shoulder. And why are you here? Oh, I'm your cousin, Blow, replied Mr. Clumsy. Your long-lost cousin from Australia. I've come to visit. Well, aren't you pleased to see me? continued Mr. Clumsy cheerfully, knocking over a flower or two as he got up, picked up his suitcase, knocking over another flower or two, or three. Mr. Fussy quite obviously wasn't pleased to see him. Oh, Oh, you'd better come in, he muttered. I say, remarked Mr. Clumsy, looking through the front door of Mr. Fussy's house. I say, what a neat little place you got here. <laughs> 
and he stepped inside, tripped over his shoelaces. He often does. Knocked over a chair, dropped his suitcase, and fell in an untidy heap on the floor. Whoops, he said. Mr. Fussy shut his eyes and heaved a sigh and groaned silently to himself. Later that evening, after Mr. Fussy had cooked them a meal, and after Mr. Clumsy had helped with the washing up, two broken plates, they sat down to talk. Mr. Fussy sat, as he always did, in a neat and tidy fashion. Mr. Clumsy sat, as he always did, in a not-so-neat and tidy fashion. How long are you staying? asked Mr. Fussy. Oh, I don't know, grinned Mr. Clumsy. A few days, week, year, haven't decided. Mr. Fussy groaned another long, silent groan to himself. And they went to bed. When he woke in the morning, Mr. Fussy jumped out of bed and went into his bathroom. Oh, oh no, he gasped. Oh no! Oh yes. Mr. Clumsy had been there before him. The towels lay in a heap on the floor. The bath was full of water. There were pools of water all over the bathroom floor. Half a tube of toothpaste had been squeezed out onto the mirror. What a mess! Mr. Fussy made it all neat and tidy as quick as he could. Then he hurried downstairs. Morning, said his cousin cheerfully. I've cooked your breakfast. Sit down. There was an awful mess everywhere. There we are. Breakfast, said Mr. Clumsy, carrying a plate of fried eggs, broken fried eggs, towards the table. And then he tripped over those shoelaces of his, and then the eggs flew through the air, and they landed all over Mr. Fussy. Sticky, greasy, yellow, fried eggs. Whoops, said Mr. Clumsy. After a week, Mr. Fussy's house didn't look like Mr. Fussy's house anymore. But after two weeks, Mr. Clumsy decided to move on. Well, thanks for having me, sport, he said to Mr. Fussy. It was very nice to see you, replied Mr. Fussy politely. What he was thinking was not so polite. It's very nice to see you going, was what he was thinking. Well, cheerio, said Mr. Clumsy. And off he went with his battered old suitcase. Goodbye, called Mr. Fussy, really meaning good riddance. Then Mr. Fussy fussed round his house as he'd never fussed before. Fussy old fusspot. That evening, Mr. Fussy was in his kitchen, polishing an egg. He heard a crash outside. <laughs> oh, no, he groaned. Oh, not Mr. Clumsy back again. It can't be. It mustn't be. It isn't. And it wasn't. It was somebody else. Somebody who just walked straight through Mr. Fussy's garden gate. Somebody who can't help having little accidents. Somebody you may have met before. Ah. Hello, smiled Mr. Bump. I've come to visit. Ha, I thought, thought I'd bump into you again sometime. Bump into you. Bump into you. Mr. Men there are. I wonder which one we shall be meeting next. Can you guess?
topsy-turvy. He was a funny sort of fellow. Everything about him was either upside down or inside out, back to front, topsy-turvy, in fact. To give you some idea of how topsy-turvy Mr. Topsy-turvy was, you ought to see his house. The front door is upside down to start with, and the curtains hang upside down at the windows. All very extraordinary. Now, this story is all about the time Mr. Topsy-turvy came to the town where you and I live. Nobody's quite sure how Mr. Topsy-turvy got there or where he came from. But he did arrive because somebody saw him getting off the train. The trouble was, he did it in a topsy-turvy way. Which really isn't all that surprising, is it? Mr. Topsy-turvy went to a hotel to find a room to spend the night. The hotel manager tried not to smile when he saw Mr. Topsy-Turvy walk into his hotel carrying his suitcase upside down and with his Topsy-Turvy hat on his head. Good afternoon, sir, he said. Can I help you? Now, something you didn't know about Mr. Topsy-Turvy is the way he speaks. You see, he sometimes gets things the wrong way round. Afternoon good said Mr. Topsy-Turvy to the hotel manager. I'd, uh, I'd room alike. The manager scratched his head. You mean you'd like a room, he asked. Uh, please, yes, replied Mr. Topsy-Turvy. Eventually, the hotel manager managed to work out what Mr. Topsy-Turvy was talking about, and he was taken up in the lift to a bedroom. Then Mr. Topsy-Turvy unpacked a suitcase, put on his pyjamas, and went to bed. He was rather tired after travelling from wherever he'd come from. The following day, Mr. Topsy-Turvy went round the town. But what a fuss his going round the town caused. He took a taxi from the hotel. But so confused the taxi driver trying to tell him where he wanted to go, the poor men drove straight into a traffic light. Oh, dear, said Mr. Topsy-Turvy. I am sorry, very. Then he went into a big department store in the middle of the town. Walked up to one of the counters. I'd like a sock of pears, he said to the lady behind the counter. You mean a pair of socks, she smiled. And showed him a pair of bright red socks. Mr. Topsy-Turvy put them on his hands. Then he tried to leave, but being Mr. Topsy-Turvy, he tried to walk down the up escalator, and all the people who were going up the up escalator all fell over themselves. Oh, it was a terrible Topsy-Turvy jumble. That day, Mr. Topsy-Turvy did all sorts of Topsy-Turvy things. to an art gallery and insisted on hanging all the pictures upside down so that he could look at them properly. And then, after Mr. Topsy-Turvy had been in the town for just one day, he disappeared. Nobody knew how he went or where he went, but he certainly went because he wasn't there anymore. The whole town breathed a sigh of relief. But what the town discovered, even though Mr. Topsy-Turvy had left, was that everything was still Topsy-Turvy. Read all it about, shouted Late the newspaper sellers. Instead of shouting, 
Read all about it. News is the here, said the television newsreader, instead of saying, here is the news. Morning good, people started saying to each other when they met him. Do do you how, instead of how do you do? Everybody was talking topsy-turvy. <laughs> now, can you think of something to say that's, that's topsy-turvy? Try on, go. I mean, go on, try. Mr. Men there are. I wonder which one we should be meeting next. Can you guess? small house underneath a daisy at the bottom of Mr. Robinson's garden. It was a very nice house, although very tiny, and it suited Mr. Small very well indeed. He liked living there. Now, this story is all about the time Mr. Small decided to get a job. The trouble was, what sort of a job could Mr. Small do? After all, there aren't that many small jobs. Mr. Small had thought about it for a long time, but hadn't had any ideas, not one. He was thinking about it now, while he was having lunch. He was having half a pea, one crumb, and a drop of lemonade. <laughs> Mr. Small thought and thought while he was eating his big lunch, but it was no use. Thinking just made him thirsty. So he had another drop of lemonade. I know, he thought to himself. After lunch, I'll go and see Mr. Robinson and ask his advice. So after lunch, he left his house and walked to Mr. Robinson's house at the top of the garden. It was quite a long walk for somebody as small as Mr. Small, and halfway there he stopped for a rest. He sat on a pebble, feeling quite out of breath. A worm crawled by and stopped. Good afternoon, Mr. Small, said the worm. Good afternoon, Walter, said Mr. Small to the worm, whom he knew quite well. Out for a walk, are you? asked Walter. Going to see Mr. Robinson, replied Mr. Small. Oh, said Walter the worm, and crawled off. Walter was a worm of very few words. After he'd rested for a while, Mr. Small set off again and walked all the rest of the way to Mr. Robinson's house without stopping at once. When he got there, he climbed up the steps to Mr. Robinson's back door. He knocked at the door. Nobody heard him. The trouble was, you see, that if you're as small as Mr. Small, you don't have a very loud knock. Mr. Small looked up. There, high above his head, was a doorbell. How can I ring the bell when I can't reach it? thought Mr. Small to himself. Just then, Mr. Small heard footsteps. It was the postman. The postman came to the door, posted his letters, and was just about to leave when he heard a voice. Hello, said the voice. The postman looked down. Hello, 
he said to Mr. Small. Who are you? I'm Mr. Small, said Mr. Small. Will you ring the bell for me? Of course I will, replied the postman in answer to Mr. Small's question. And reaching out, he pressed the bell with his finger. Thank you, said Mr. Small. My pleasure, said the postman, and off he went. Mr. Small heard footsteps coming to the door. The door opened. Mr. Robinson looked out. That's funny, he said. I'm sure I heard somebody ring the bell. He was about to shut the door when he heard a little voice. Hello, said the voice. Hello, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson looked down and down. Hello, he said. What are you doing here? I've come to ask your advice, said Mr. Small to Mr. Robinson. Well, said Mr. Robinson, you'd better come in, have a talk. Mr. Small followed Mr. Robinson into the house, and perched on the arm of Mr. Robinson's favourite chair, he told him how he couldn't think of a job that he could do. Mr. Robinson sipped a cup of tea and listened. So you see, Mr. Small explained, how difficult it is. Yes. Yes, I can see that, said Mr. Robinson. But leave it to me. Mr. Robinson knew a lot of people. Mr. Robinson knew somebody who worked in a restaurant and arranged for Mr. Small to work there. Putting mustard into mustard pots. But... Mr. Small kept falling into the pots and getting covered in mustard, so he left that job. Mr. Robinson knew somebody who worked in a sweet shop and arranged for Mr. Small to work there, serving sweets. But Mr. Small kept falling into the sweet jars, so he left that job. Mr. Robinson knew somebody who worked in a place where they made matches and arranged for Mr. Small to work there, packing matches into boxes. But... Mr. Small kept getting shut in the boxes with the matches, so he left that job. Mr. Robinson knew somebody who worked on a farm and arranged for Mr. Small to work there, sorting out the brown eggs from the white eggs. But Mr. Small kept getting trapped by the eggs, so he left that job. What are we going to do with you? Mr. Robinson asked Mr. Small one evening. Don't know said Mr. Small, in a small voice. I've got one more idea, said Mr. Robinson. I know somebody who writes stories for children. Perhaps you could work for him. So the following day, Mr. Robinson took Mr. Small to meet the man who wrote children's stories. Can I work for you? Mr. Small asked the man. Yes, you can, replied the man. Pass me that pencil and tell me all about the jobs you've been doing. Then I'll write a story about it. I'll call it Mr. Small, he added. But children won't want to hear a story all about me, exclaimed Mr. Small. Yes, they will, replied the man. They like it very much. And you did, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you.